Race fans, it's time to buckle in and listen to the fastest hour in racing radio. Your driver is a multi-time NASCAR winner and Hall of Famer, Mark Martin. We cover racing, grassroots, history, we bench race, we talk life, and most importantly, we smash the loud pedal. It's time to turn some laps on the Mark Martin Podcast. Episode number 31 of the Mark Martin Podcast, and we're going to get into the year 1990, a year of many firsts uh, along the way. But before we get to that, make sure to hit markmartinpod.com, markmartinpod.com. Get all of the old podcasts. Subscribe to us on various podcast players. Make sure to give us that five-star rating. But Mark... As you said, this is a landmark, a bookmark. This is a huge year for you. 1990. Let's talk about it. Like I've explained in the other podcasts, um, but I want to go over it again. You know, uh, people's recollections of things are the way they perceive them. They're what they see. They're what they believe. They're always biased in into, you know, what, what they think and what they, what they see. I'm no different. Um, but I believe that I'm a very fair person and I'll go over some of the conspiracy theories and, and some of the broken, uh, heartedness of, uh, 1990. Um, in many ways it is, uh, it is one of my, uh, well, it's, it's my coming out party. It's when I finally start to heal. And if you've been listening to the previous podcast, you'll hear, um, I finally start healing from the disappointments uh, and and heartache and and uh, and everything that I had to go through through the '80s um, to get back to NASCAR. We finally got our first win in October of '89, and uh, been so close for so long. And now we get to go into the season fresh with a fantastic season under our belt running third in the points, which should have been second, but we blew up in the last race. Ah, uh, so, so we were third. So, um, man, we're, we're charged up and ready to go. Um, we take a little bit different approach. Uh, we're going to do a good bit, you know, do a good bit less testing, but plenty of testing, uh, because testing was still allowed back then but not nearly as much as we, we tested ourselves to death in, in 1989. Um, we learned a lot and, uh, we were applying them and, um, uh, better prepared. It would be our third year, uh, since the formation of Roush racing. And, uh, we were just much, much better prepared, um, going into the season. And we went to Daytona and Daytona was a typical Daytona. Uh, I don't remember, uh, I would remember if it was good. So, um, that's why I say it was typical. Um, they always called, uh, Daytona, uh, the world, world center of racing. And I called it the world center of pain. Um, I de- desperately disliked the place. Um, probably, uh, more and more, the more I raced there, um, 1988, I guess I didn't care. 1989, I should have won the the July race at Daytona. Had everybody ho- totally killed, totally killed. My car out handled everybody's car by a ton. And uh, we ran it out of gas with uh, 25 miles to go. So um, I'm sure whatever disappointment we had at Daytona was was normal, and we go to I, th- I believe the second race uh, was Richmond back then. We go to Richmond, and race day is cold. I'm talking about cold and windy and blowing and snowing. It was dusting snow, and uh, so we got ready to start the race. And Jack and his uh, his wisdom of uh, engines was scared for that cold air to get to the engine. So he had, uh, the boys tape the cowl, uh, shut. And so it was only pulling air from underneath the hood, you know, hot engine air into the carburetor. And that thing wouldn't run a lick. I mean, I can't believe it. You know, it was just really, really, really down on power when we started the race. So when we got a chance to pit, this first thing it is rip that tape off. 
now we're back, got our power back. Now we're back going. So uh, he gets down toward the late, late stages of the race and, um, and the last pit stop comes and, you know, we're not going to win. Um, we're probably going to run second to Earnhardt and Steve Meal makes a call, two tires. And he put me out in front of Dale and, uh, I set sail on the restart. Um, and we won the race and, uh, did victory lane. Oh, so cold, bitter cold spit and snow. We did victory lane, did all the stuff. And uh, Arlene and I piled up in the car and I drove back to Greensboro and, uh, I'm at my house in Greensboro and I get a phone call from a media member, uh, wanting to get a quote about, uh, our penalty that I knew nothing about yet. Um, so, you know, started trying to find out what happened. Well, what happened after I left the racetrack was they say, they meaning people that talk to me that, you know, I believe, you know, people close to me who would be allies of mine who might be biased, but they say that Richard Childress pointed out to the NASCAR officials that the thing had a two and a half inch carburetor spacer on it. And, uh, the rule was two inch carburetor spacer back up a little bit back in the shop. I'm told that, uh, when Robin Pemberton, uh, was, uh, finishing up the car to go up there, um, uh, put the air cleaner on it, closed the hood. Um, this was a very light short track car, lightweight hood was flimsy and the air cleaner is supposed to push up against the hood and for whatever reason, this, you know, there was a gap in the hood. He noticed the hood would push down really easy. So he took it apart and he put a two and a half inch spacer on it. had a two inch spacer, put a two and a half inch spacer on it. Hood fit perfect. Wasn't any problem because all year, um, the year before they had NASCAR had been allowing teams to weld to the top of the intake manifold because one of the other manufacturers had a real tall manifold built. So it was unfair to the other manufacturers. So they just started letting you weld, you know, the, the thing as tall as you wanted. So in Robin's mind, it didn't matter anymore what the carburetor spacer was because you could be as high as you wanted. In a reality, you could have welded it on to the top of the manifold and we wouldn't have got, got penalized. But as it turns out, uh, a rare occasion that Bill France Jr. didn't go to the racetrack, which may or may not have made a difference, uh, was communicated. He was back in Daytona, uh, from what I understand, and he was communicated with and with all this problem. They got a two-and-a-half-inch carburetor spacer. Rule book says two. Yeah, you could say that. You didn't have anybody arguing and saying, nah, we've been letting them weld onto the car, you know, onto the manifold. He got the information that we had a two and a half inch carburetor spacer and the rule was two. And he said, put them at the tail end of the lead lap. And they did. So that, that cost us 46 points and find us, I don't know, a bunch of money too, uh, which came right out of, you know, since we didn't, since we had to pay that fine, I didn't get get paid for that race, which mattered a lot to me because I still was fairly broke, uh, young family man. And so that was incredibly disappointed. I'd won a race, didn't get paid. Uh, and, you know, they've done this and taken the 46 points. Conspiracy theorists say NASCAR took that championship away, away from us because they didn't like Jack because he was a northerner and and because they wanted Earnhardt to win the championship because Richard Childress was super tight with uh, Bill France because Richard was one of the very few that raced at, at uh, Talladega at his first race when all the drivers boycotted. And so Richard, uh, uh, Bill French Jr., always loved Richard and watched out for him. And Richard's a good guy. 
a good guy, good racer, good. He's a racer. And so that's a conspiracy theory. I didn't say that. I'm just telling you what people say. I'll tell you right now that I don't believe that there's any way that NASCAR could have known that Bill France could have known that we would even contend for a championship. So in, in the second race of the season. Okay. So that's bullshit. So, uh, the bottom line is that we got penalized for something that we probably shouldn't have got penalized for that. We may or may not have got penalized for if Bill would have been at the racetrack and Jack and Robin and Steve could have pled their case. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we were not able to, uh, you know, to plead our case effectively and we got that fine and we moved forward. We shook it off. Uh, we continued to have a good season, marched on forward, uh, really fast, really, really strong. Um, we went to Sonoma, which is usually in, I don't know, around the first of June and we hauled, but there, uh, if I, you know, it may, may not have been this year, but I think I ran second to Ernie out there. It might've been a different year. Uh, but we all, but we left, left Sonoma leading the points around, around the first of June, early June or something. And we led the points the whole season, um, until very late in the season. And I'll get to that in a minute. Um, Earnhardt and I, uh, had a epic battle at North Wilkesboro. Um, we, uh, uh, and this is probably, this is getting down probably close to October, close to the first of October. Cause it was right before the Charlotte race in October. So we go to North Wilkesboro. We sat on the outside pole, I believe. Um, uh, we start the race. We got a, I believe we've got a 1200 in the right front with a rubber and, uh, we start the race and we're on radials radials had, you know, were fairly new to us. Um, and by, you know, so, so the radials were throwing us a little bit of a curve. We start to race and we're tight and we're tight and we're tight. And, um, you know, there's probably six cars in the lead lap on the last pit stop late, late in a race, I'm going to say there's 60 laps to go, uh, something like that, 50 to go. And Steve Mill makes another brilliant call. Steve Mill was amazing on the pit box. What a, what a great guy, great friend, smart. Uh, I I wish that Steve and I still work together. I wish I could go into, to work with Steve all the time. Uh, the dude is just so smart. He inspires me. Anyway, he makes the call. We're going to pull the rubber out. Well, they like to never got the rubber out. Of course, we went out last on the lead lap. There might have been 10, 10 cars in the lead lap. I don't know how many of the were. You know, we went to, toward the back on the restart. And, of course, Earnhardt's up front. And we, up through the green, we march up through there. Oh, baby, did it ever fix that car. Man, that son of a buck was right. And uh, we drove up through there. And with probably, I'm going to guess, 20 to go, we catch Dale. And I turn down underneath him in, in one. He don't leave much room, but there's enough room for one car to fit underneath him. I turn underneath him, drive up to his door, and uh, just give him a little little rub donut in the door and jam the gas. And we come up off of two side by side. And I remember I, I could see the grandstands, the fans on the back, on the fence and everything just going nuts. I mean, I saw stuff flying and everything. I caught that out of the corner of my eye, just people going nuts in their stands. And uh, we drive down the back stretch and I clear him. We go into three and four and uh, he rolls up, pokes me in the ass. And right when he hit me in the back bumper, I jammed the gas to the floor, drove it up out of the corner and drove off. And, uh, and that was it. We won that race and, uh, we served notice. That was win number two for the season. Um, Earnhardt had been winning a few more races, but we had been so consistent and so good that, uh, that we were still leading the points 
we served notice that we were serious about that championship. We went on to Charlotte, and uh, I believe Earnhardt ran the wheels, made a pit stop, and one of his and left the pits, and one of the wheels came off, and I don't know some some of my team guys were crying and bitching because they let them go down there or something, jack it up, put a wheel on it or something. Uh, you know, they always were afraid that, you know, those guys were getting shown favoritism and, you know, they, they should have, they were, I mean, Richard Childress had earned uh, the right to, to be, to have, to be treated, uh, really, really, really well. And Earnhardt was, uh, Man, he was the lifeblood of, I mean, he was filling the stands because the stand, the, the half the people came there to see Earnhardt win and the other half came to see him get beat. Um, he was just, uh, he was polarizing figure and, and, um, anyway, Earnhardt tried trouble, man, we're, we're looking good in our points and we go on down back then. The next to last race was Phoenix. And then the last race was Atlanta. And we go to Atlanta. I think we go to Atlanta before Phoenix and we test and we take three race cars, three of our cars. And you remember me telling, if you've listened to these other ones, you know, we were typically down on power, about 50 horsepower uh, at that time to uh, at least to Robert Yates. I, I don't, I can't say for sure about the Chevy guys. Um, but our cars were really good. We were building really good cars, uh, fair on aero, extremely good on, you know, mechanic mechanically, as far as lightweight. And we were really good with our suspensions, really good with our setups, really stayed on our tires. Good ran smart races. Steve Mill called, brilliant races. So we were, we were in good shape. So we go to this test with three cars. Earnhardt shows up at the test. He runs about an hour and a half and he hauls ass and he tells them he's good to go. And he leaves and goes hunting and they put their stuff up and go home. They serve notice. They think they're ready. They think they're psyching us out which they're not. We're just, we're testing all our stuff to see which car's the best. And, uh, so I think Davey was going to be late getting there. I don't remember exactly what the deal was. And there's like, take Davey's car out. So sure. So we'll throw the rags in the thing and I go out and, uh, the first lap by I'm like 15, one hundreds quicker than we've run in my car. And, you know, it's like, it's a ton, ton of motor. I mean, he's making 700 horsepower at this time and we're making, you know, 645. And all I'm told is, is that dynos aren't the same, you know, and that Robert's dynos jacked up and the numbers, you know, you make them read whatever you want to make them read. And the one's in North Carolina and one in Michigan, but there was a significant horsepower difference. The car really wasn't any better, but it probably wasn't worse. Um, it was probably fairly equal, but the motor thing was fantastic. We needed everything that we could get, to try to make sure we won this championship. So we made the decision and Jack blessed it that just let me have that. Let me have that car with the car included the motor for that race. Robert was fine to help afford, you know, they couldn't win that year and they were going to try to help us help a Ford team win, win the championship. So we all agreed on it. We're going to borrow, uh, one of Davey's cars that I ran quicker than I did in my cars with. And, uh, you know, for that final race, we still got a nice, nice point lead. So we wrap that up. And, uh, I don't feel psyched out at all. I just, we're making the best decisions we can under the circumstances. And, uh, and, and so we head out to Phoenix and we hit Phoenix, man. And we just don't run. I mean, we just don't handle, we can't handle, we can't handle, we can't handle. We qualify 
I don't know, not as good as we usually did. And uh, we just didn't run good. Didn't run like we usually run. Uh, Run much worse than usual. And I don't know what the problem was. But back then, you got five-point bonus for sitting on the pole and five-point bonus for leading the most laps. And unbelievably, Earnhardt sat on the pole, which is unusual for him to do. He didn't sit on many poles. And he led the most laps. And we floundered, and we pitted, and we put tires on, and we put tires on, and we put tires on, and we just could not move up. It's one of the first times that I really remember that track position was so freaking critical. And the thing was is we weren't making downforce back then. We had that car had lift in the front and race trim and maybe 150, 200 pounds of downforce in the back. It wasn't anything special, probably a couple hundred pounds of downforce in the back maybe. So it was an aero that was killing us. It just, it was just all the cars were so close to the same speed that no one could make a different lane and make anything happen. And I just, we just kept pitting and trying to put tires on and tires just wouldn't help. And we just hung around 10th and we finished 10th and Earnhardt won. And he just erased that nice point cushion that we had. And we went into, we went into Atlanta in the final race and we ran good. We qualified in the top 10 and we ran in the top 10. We finished sixth. Sixth isn't bad. Um, but it wasn't good enough. Earnhardt ran about third. And uh, we lost the championship by 20 points. Uh, actually, we lost it, I think, by 26 points. So, conspiracy theorists said that we would have won the championship if we hadn't have got screwed on that one penalty that we really didn't have coming, which is true. Uh, we didn't have it coming that we would have won the championship by 20 points. But here's what I say. We didn't. We didn't score enough points to overcome the penalty, and we got the penalty in the second race of the season. The best thing to do is put your big boy pants on, man up, and move forward. And that's exactly what, you know, yes, when when Atlanta was over with, I was disappointed, but I wasn't crushed because I was just getting started. And there was plenty of championships out there in front of me. And I had won three more races, so um, which was really my main objective. Um, you know, if you've listened to all these other podcasts, my you know my life's dream was to finally win a cup race, and we finally did that in '89, and then we added three more to the to the total, and in '90, set on some more poles, run really fast, and had everybody's attention. So, well, made a tremendous run at the championship, and I was proud of of our effort and everything that we did. Um, There's a lot of people that criticize us for uh, making the the 28, borrowing the 28 car in the last race. But I would have had to, you know, I would have had to pretty much won the race with Earnhardt finishing where he did, you know, I had, I would have had to run significantly better than I did. Um, you know, I would have had to, I would have had, you know, probably run, beat him and run third or something, second or third with him running that good. They just turned it on. Um, they just were hot when they needed to be. We had a comfortable lead until we got to to Phoenix the next last race, and we failed to perform at that one race. Outside of that, we did, you know, an incredible job. So I was really, you know, looking into '91 uh, with, you know, I will get it. We'll get it this, you know, the next year, and that's kind of the attitude I had. But once we get into '91, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it did have a, a negative effect. I think it had a negative effect on our, uh, performance. We'll talk about it. We got behind on our arrow in 91. Um, uh, I had, you know, probably stepped back a little bit from pushing our guys 
um, to be a better leader, sometimes you you can't tell people what to do. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't piss off Robin and Steve. Um, I wanted to make sure that we had good chemistry and that we got the most out of our race cars. And, uh, you know, I was starting to get pulled on from a media and sponsor and appearances and all those kinds of things more and was having, you know, more of that on my plate. So, um, we'll talk about 91. We got a little bit back behind, but 19, 1990 was a good year overall. Um, it was a crushing blow to know that we came that close and came up short, but going from a, a first year team to a, a contender for second in the points the first year and contending for first place in the points in the second year was an incredible feat uh, for for everyone involved, including Jack Roush and including the engines um, that were built in Livonia, Michigan, um, going from not building NASCAR engines to building championship contending race team engines, um, you know, in in the second year of our uh, of our organization. And then, of course, in the third year, uh, coming so close to uh, to pulling it off. So that was uh, that was our effort for 1990. 1990 was also the first uh, year of the Folgers sponsorship, uh, a car that's become legendary, only ran two years. But tell us about how that all came together. You know, I don't really know. I don't really remember how who, you know, how how it came together. Um, Roush uh, organization managed to uh, to get it put together. And um, I was honored to, you know, uh, to step up to a, a, a sponsor that had been in NASCAR and been on Tim Richmond's car and and uh, Benny Parsons car and and Kenny Schrader's car and whatnot. It was a, it was a, a real feather in our cap. Not to mention that it paid better and uh, put us in a position to, uh, you know, uh, to have more stuff, more tools and parts and pieces and and equipment to work with. So, um, yeah, that was a, that was a great, great deal. It was really good, good looking car, uh, great program. Got to do some cool stuff, uh, you know, promotions and stuff with them and everything. So tell us about, um, I mean, you don't even really drink coffee though, either. I went to Daytona and I had a cup of coffee Sunday morning, cup of, cup of Folgers Sunday morning and ran and then ran the Daytona 500 and I needed to pee so freaking bad during the race. It hurt so freaking bad. After the race, I drove the car straight to the port of potty and parked outside the port of John and got out and went to pee. And of course I couldn't hardly pee when you're in, you've been in pain for that long. You can't hardly get out of the car and relax. So it took me forever to get, get relieved, but it hurt freaking bad. And I, I learned right then I will never touch uh coffee on race day. I just uh, wasn't prepared for that. So, so even though you're driving the Folgers car and you're selling the sponsorship message, you are dead set not to drink coffee anymore during race day. Not on, not on race day, but you know, hell I was sponsored the year before by a beer and I had uh, quit drinking in on, on new year's day, 1989 or the day before the day before new year's on, on, on 1989. So I had a beer sponsor that I didn't, didn't drink beer, but, uh, so at least, uh, with Folgers, I, I could partake in, uh, you know, a nice cup of coffee when, when I wanted to, except on Sunday mornings. There you go. So tell us about another thing um, that was pivotal to your career. And one of the, the, as you've talked in the past, one of the favorite parts of your career, the IROC series. Well, and yeah, that, uh, you know, that's true. But one other thing that I want to say is when uh, uh, Roush put the deal together with, uh, with Folgers, somehow or another, uh, Valvoline had wanted on board, you know, we were hot, man, we were hot and Valvoline wanted us and the deal had already been made with, with Folgers. So they were pissed. And so they, they took the associate sponsorship on the car and said, when, when they leave, we want it. 
And so the deal was two years with Folgers and, and then, uh, and then Valvoline got it. And of course that was, uh, that ran all the way through the nineties. And, uh, that's really what I'm known for is the Valvoline number six. So, yeah. So, uh, I didn't realize that 1990 was my first year. I don't really remember specifics about IROC. I can, I remember certain things, but I don't remember a lot of things cause I didn't build those cars. I didn't work on those cars. I didn't do the tires. I didn't set them up, you know, but yeah, if that was the first year that I got an IROC car, I do remember because I ran so good in 89, I remember getting the call over the winter of 89 now and, and asking if, you know, being told that I was invited to participate in the international race of champions big one of the biggest well it was it was the big, biggest honor of my career to that point i couldn't believe that i was going to get to race with you know aj foyt and and people like mario andretti and emerson fittipaldi and you know just danny all these guys all these people that were national racing motorsports heroes it was an incredible invite, and it was the beginning of something that was really special. Like I, if I talk about IROC and only IROC, you won't hear the brokenheartedness and the disappointments that you hear from the other other part of my career. In IROC, you don't have pit stops, your motors don't blow up hardly ever, and uh, you don't have bad pit stops, and you know, it's just all the things that frustrated me through my career. I didn't have to deal with an IROC. Just walked over there, strapped in, went out on the racetrack, and kicked some ass. 1990 was also another year with Bill Davis in the, well, what was the Bush Series, but now the Xfinity Series. You're kind of wrapping up your uh, your time with Bill Davis. Let's touch on that quick. Yeah. Well, by that time, Bill had his program on track our cars were beginning to be stupid fast uh, we had the bodies we had the bodies on them right we had the setups on them right and uh had had some good people working on them bill eat breathe and slip it you know that's all he thought about like i did when i worked on race cars and it was really it really started to show our our stuff was strong. Um, I don't remember specific, you know, specific races, but uh, that may have been the year that that we ran Myrtle Beach, and I think the race, we, we, the Myrtle Beach race, race that I drove for Bill, uh, the the one I'm thinking of, we qualified on Friday night. We went home and went to bed in the hotel and I laid there for about two hours thinking about my car because I didn't like my car. It wouldn't handle right. Uh, everybody back then ran a, uh, you know, like a 250 left rear or, or a 200 left rear and a 250 right rear. And I'm like, nobody ever runs more than 50 pounds of rear spring and that car's tight and that car's tight and that car tight. So I'm, I'm laying there in bed thinking about how to get that thing to turn and i just decide nobody's ever run more than you know on, the, on those cars at that time ever run more than 250 right rear spring i just said i'm gonna put a three 325 in the right rear of that son of a bitch so we'll go back out there saturday and uh tell them put a th- you know check it out put a 325 in the right rear 250 in the left rear and we rolled her out there on the racetrack and she was good she was really good. I was proud of it. Uh, Tommy Ellis had us killed, though. Tommy had us beat. Hell, I couldn't even see Tommy. He was so far gone. We took the flight flag. I, I couldn't see Tommy. I went into one, start coming off a of two, and Tommy's running, coasting down the back stretch on the inside out of gas. And we won that race. It was pretty cool. The wins that I got when you didn't know you were going to, when they were a surprise, like that one, like the all-star race in 1998 and uh, some of the others. The ones that you don't know, don't see coming are the most fun, most exciting. It was That was pretty cool. So that's going to wrap up 1990. Before we get to 1991, we're going to let, uh, we're going to take a pause. We're going to do fan questions on the next podcast to let the viewers know. 
But uh, send those in over Twitter. Send those in on uh, the website. We're going to get to those in the next episode. But again, you've been listening to the episode 31 of the Mark Martin Podcast, year 1990. Thank you for subscribing and listening to the Mark Martin Podcast. Remember to give us a five-star rating in your app store. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Mark Martin POD. The Mark Martin Podcast is a production of the Accelerated Podcast Network.